on back there. A teenage boy just passed his driving test and he inquired of his father as you know to when they could discuss his use of the family car his dad said well let's make a deal you bring your grades from a C up to a B average study your Bible a little which you haven't been doing and get your hair cut and we'll talk about the car so the boy thought about it for a moment and he decided he'd settle for the offer and he agreed to it after about six weeks his father said son you brought your grades up and I've observed that you've been studying your Bible but I'm disappointed that you haven't had your hair cut and the boy said you know dad I've been thinking about that and I've noticed in my studies of the Bible that Samson had long hair and John the Baptist had long hair Moses had long hair there's even strong evidence that Jesus had long hair and his father's reply was, did you also notice that they all walked everywhere they went? <laughs> Luke chapter 7, 29 and 30. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. Would you bow your heads? Lord, I thank you for the privilege I have to bring these few morsels to the family in this house today. And I pray that you'll guide and direct the words that they will go where you want them to go and have the effect that you want them to have. In Jesus' name, amen. So in other words, they had already experienced repentance. They'd been baptized by John. It was a baptism of repentance, which is what he preached, and they had already experienced a repentance. So they were ready to go farther with God. In other words, they wanted now to be holy. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. So here we have people who are completely wrapped up in their own self-righteousness, the Pharisees. They considered themselves perfect and they looked down on everyone else. They were elitists. Observe that in verse 29, it, reversed, it refers to all people. It says all people. Jesus was speaking to a crowd about John the Baptist. John's disciples had come to Jesus with the question in Luke uh, chapter 7 and verse 19. He sent them to Lord, the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? The reason he sent his disciples was because he was in prison at this time. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus if he was the Messiah. John's disciples had seen the miracles that Jesus was doing and had reported what they had seen to John. At this time, of course, John was in prison. The people Jesus was talking uh, to had experienced the baptism of repentance that was preached by John. Even tax collectors. They were thought to be among the worst of sinners because they were helping the Romans to extract the wealth of the country and a lot of them cheated. They overtaxed the people and skimmed some off for themselves. They were kind of a hated people. In other words, they were sinners. Amen. The baptism of John was to them a sign of repentance of a changed life. But they were not born again because Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. The debt had not been paid. Redemption had not been purchased. The redemption price was paid at the cross and the cross hadn't happened yet. So they weren't born again yet at least 
at this time. There was repentance. They were convinced to go God's way instead of going their own way. And that's part of the born again experience. They acknowledged that God's way was right, it says in our verse. Acknowledge that God's way was right. In other words, at some point they decided to go God's way. They had not been going God's way. A dramatic change was taking place. And John's baptism was a sign of their repentance. Observe that the Pharisees had not been baptized by John. They rejected the call to repentance. They thought they were righteous, but they were self-righteous. They would not just submit to any authority except their own. Most of the world is still in rejection of the authority of our Lord. A lot of people, and you probably know some, think that they can go to heaven because of being a nice person. But it doesn't work that way. We can't be nice enough. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough wonderful things for people to earn our way into heaven. You can't earn your way. If you could, then Jesus wasted his time dying on the cross. John's words came to those who would choose to change their ways, to go God's way and accept water baptism as a sign of their repentance. John's ministry was preparatory for the coming kingdom of God. The prophecy in Isaiah 40 and verse 3, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John went into the wilderness he was that person. Luke 3, 2-4, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the, in the book of the words of Isaiah the, Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's preaching about repentance prepared the way. Repentance prepares the way for the Lord to have his way in the life of the sinner. First you hear the word, then you repent because of what you have heard. You heard the good news. You realize that you are a sinner and, and you need Jesus to be your Savior. Then the Holy Spirit comes in and abides with you and you have a new life. John preached that sinners needed to repent and that water baptism would be a sign of that repentance. Water baptism is now to us identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The Messiah was coming. The wrath of God was coming. Luke 3, 7, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? John's preaching was about a changed life. Luke 3, 10 to 14, what should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they ask, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. In other words, what you are doing displeases God. Change your behavior. That's what he was telling them. And that change of behavior is repentance. John's baptism was a sign of repentance, a sign of a new attitude, a new life, a new way of living. 
the Pharisees in verse 30 had not been baptized by John and they were not in repentance. They existed in a state of self-righteousness. We don't need to repent, we're already holy. The holiness of the Pharisees and the scribes, our experts in the law, was about strict, strict observance to rules. Rules and regulations. If we do exactly what the rules are, then we're righteous. In contrast, that is, to the two commands of Christ in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In contrast, the Pharisees had developed a system of 613 laws. 365 negative commands. That means don't do this and don't do that and don't touch this and go, go here and don't go there. And 248 positive laws. By the time Christ came, it had produced a heartless, cold, arrogant brand of righteousness. As such, it contained at least 10 tragic flaws. One, new laws continually needed to be invented for new situations. Number two, accountability to God was replaced by accountability to men. Number three, it reduces a person's ability to personally discern. Number four, it creates a judgmental spirit. Number five, the Pharisees confused personal preference with, dis with divine law. Number six, it produces inconsistencies. Number seven, it created a false standard of righteousness. Number eight, it became a burden to the Jews. Number nine, it was strictly external. Number 10, it was rejected by Christ. That came from uh, Fan the Flame by J. Stowell Moody. John's appeal, you brood of vipers, was spoken to everyone in that crowd. The crowds that were coming to him were all sinners. It seems that the common people accepted his message, repented of their sins, and were baptized as a sign of the repentance. The self-righteous Pharisees were not baptized. There was no repentance in them. It seems that they were to observe, they were there to observe what John was preaching and what he was doing to make sure that he was not violating any of their rules. They did the same thing to Jesus, and he was able to refute all of their accusations. They couldn't control him. They wanted him dead. Not only that, but they wanted him to suffer the cruel death of crucifixion. John came to prepare the way for the Lord to make his paths straight that fulfilled scripture. The way of the Lord is the path of where he wants to go. Where does he want to go? He wants to go into the heart, into the life of every person every person the appeal is individual as it was in john's day so it is even now repentance and the sign of it baptism was and is for the individual it's not a mass thing it's you getting baptized it's you repenting it's you asking jesus to be lord there will always be those uh, who seek God and those who don't. But the provision is available to everyone. There are those who don't want to change the way they're living. They think they'll have to give something up. It's more like God will set them free from something that separates them from God. There are those who don't want anyone to come to repentance. Paul was such a one until he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. There are those who come to a crossroad, choose to go God's way, 
and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and there are those who stay on the broad path that leads to destruction. Back to, back to verse 29 and 30 in Luke chapter 7. All the people, even tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right. When they heard Jesus' words. There's power in the word. Psalm 119, 9 to 16. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I re count all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one, in, as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Because they had been baptized by John, the baptism was the outward sign of the inward repentance. Repentance is two turnings. Turning away from sin and turning toward God. Turning away from the enticements of the world. Turning your back on those things and embracing a life of holiness. A life pleasing to God. It says without holiness no one will see God. In verse 30, but the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by God. Most of the world, most of our family and friends reject God's purpose. Most of them are ready to ridicule people of faith. To the church at Laodicea, Revelation 3, 19 and 20, to those whom I love, I, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This was written to the church. To the church. Be earnest and repent. Here I am, I'm standing and knocking. This was written to the church at Laodicea. We don't think of ourselves as being like the Pharisees. Unlike the Pharisees, we have been in repentance. But all believers need to be in repentance. That's a continuous thing. Because the devil's going to put new temptations up in front of you all the time. Repentance is a continual effort. The enemy is tr constantly trying to derail us. Sin crouches at the door. We all fail sometime or other. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. This word is not only to the unrepentant. The word is for me and for you. The Pharisees thought that they were living in a way that pleased God. They were sinners and didn't know it. The difference is that I'm a sinner and I do know it. Like Paul, I'm repentant. I'm a repentant, forgiven, born-again sinner. You brood of vipers, but they thought they were the good guys. When I got saved, I had the good guy attitude. Legalism. There are certain things the Bible forbids with very specific words. But there are certain things that are our own ideas that we try to impose. I remember when we first um, became members in the Assembly of God Church. This was in Hartford, Connecticut about 100 years ago. Probably 60 years ago, maybe probably about 60 years ago, they made us sign a card that promised that we would not consume alcohol, tobacco, go to movies, social dancing, 
I don't remember what else, but there were certain things that was legalism that we were not to do. Tobacco, alcohol, social dancing, movies, tattoos, hats on in church. But I'm afraid we judge people's behavior by our own standards. We're offended by people's behavior. God is offended by my behavior. The only way I could ever stand before God is that Jesus paid my penalty. Praise his holy name. I don't think that if I smoke a pipe, God's going to keep me out of heaven. But the Assembly of God Church did. That's what they preached against that. Well, if you smoke cigarettes and you know that it's going to harm your health, maybe that would. Maybe that would. Or if somebody else sees you smoking a cigarette and you're a holy person and they think it's okay and they get cancer and die. So it's best not to even do that. Alcohol is the same way. You know, I don't think God's going to keep me out of heaven if I drink a glass of wine. But I don't. And I counsel you not to. Because somebody sees you in a clean living person and they might have a weakness for alcohol which is a destroyer of their life. It ruins families. So I'm saying not to do that. I don't think taking a, taking a, a sip is going to keep you out of heaven. Drunkenness probably will. Drunkenness is spelled out in the Bible. I don't think social dancing is going to keep me out of heaven. I was a square dancer. I was pretty good at it. Matter of fact, I got to teach the girls' gym class in our high school because the teacher had a record and a, and a diagram, and she had no idea how to do that. And one of the, it was a girls' gym class, and one of the girls said, Woody knows how to do this, and he's in a study hall. And they came and got me, and I taught the girls' gym class how to square dance twice. <laughs> That was one of the few feathers that's in my cap. I taught the girls how to square dance. But seriously, we had, a, we had a, a young lady in our church, and she wanted to talk to me. She was miffed because one of the other ladies had a face piercing, a little tiny thing in her face, in her cheek, or her lip, wherever it was. And she was all... Been out of shape over that. And I said, do you have a scripture for this? And she gave me a Leviticus scripture about adornments. And I said, what are these things in your ear? Oh, that's different. No, it's not. Don't judge what somebody else is doing. If you think that's an adornment and you shouldn't do it, then don't do it. But don't pass your judgments on to somebody else. Amen? But that's what we were doing. Hats on in church. Now there's preachers that preach with torn jeans and a backwards hat on in church. And if they're saving souls, more power to them. We think that's socially unacceptable. So what? If they're winning souls, so what? It's not. It offends us. So what? <laughs> we have to get over some of these things. But we judge people's behavior by our, by our own standards. And let God be the judge. Continuing with this written by James, the Lord's brother, who didn't believe in him until the resurrection, James 4, 7 to 10, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God, and he will lift you up. That grieving and mourning is at your own sin because it caused Jesus to suffer. My sin caused Jesus to suffer on the cross my sin and yours so we should be grieving about that at least at the moment of our salvation 
all the self-righteousness in the world can't get me into heaven. Repentance is necessary, but faith and receiving Christ is what God requires. If I could bargain my way into heaven with a load of good works, then, as I said before, Jesus wasted his time dying on the cross. We're not all God's children. You become a child of God. John 1, 12. To as many as received him, even to those that believed on his name, he gave the power to become children of God. You become God's child. But then we have to stay children of God. It's possible to have your name blotted out from the Lamb's book of life, Exodus 32 and 33. The Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. We get saved. And we have to be holy and be getting closer to God all the time. I went through a period of backsliding. Three years I was that way. I wasn't living for God. This is before it happened. It began while I was still in church. I was teaching Sunday school. I was on the church board. By all appearances, I looked like a sainted believer. But internally, I, I mean, I was just going through the motions. Inside, I had grown cold toward God. I neglected my Bible reading, neglected my prayer life. You can't do that. When the storms of life came along, and they will, you've probably already experienced some of those storms. I was like an empty paper bag, blown away, instead of having a rock in my bag for I couldn't be blown away. <laughs> it took three years for me to get back. Three years. I finally got back. It was like getting saved the first time. I think I've told this before. You probably all heard it, but I like telling it. I was working, photographing seniors in Lock Haven High School. I was down in the basement. Sort of a gloomy place that was. And I had my studio set up in a wrestling room down there was this was under the cafeteria and uh, I had a rickety card table where I wrote up my sittings and I used to go on the road for about three or four days without coming home I'd stay in a motel because I worked from nine in the morning till nine at night and I was weary and after I went out for supper I came back and the first two sittings didn't come and I was just sitting there and I put my head down on the table and I said out loud, I just wish I could go home. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, you're not ever going home. He said, I'm your father and your home is here. But you won't see it if you keep going the way you go. And that startled me enough. I went to my motel room, got on my knees and repented. Sunday I found myself in the home church, the New Life Church down there. And... He said to me, I'm not going to, I won't deal with, I'm not going to deal with you again. It's your last chance. No more. <laughs> but God is good. We both went astray at the same time. It took her seven more years. She was out for set for ten years. And the ladies in the church would come around me at the altar. We're praying for your wife. We're praying for you. Seven years. They prayed. Jane Grove was the leader of that. And when she prays about something, get out of the way. It's going to happen. Just stand back and watch. Seven years, but she prayed her in. Yeah, God is amazing. So amazing. But what about you today? Do you live a happy-go-lucky life and don't open your Bible during a week and don't have a prayer life? You're in danger if you do that. You need to have a prayer life. You need to pray, pray, I pray in the morning, I pray in the evening. I pray for all of you, every one of you. And some that aren't here, I pray for. Would you all stand? I'm not going to call you down here to 
for repentance or anything, but I want you to think about this. You know, we, we get saved and we're riding on a crest of a wave, but the wave doesn't stay up there. There's hills and there's valleys. There's hard things to go through. And there's times when we're just riding along with God and everything's peachy. And there's times when it's not. But we need to have a prayer life. Pray for me if you can't think of anything else. <laughs> Pray for this church. Pray for these empty seats. Pray for Israel. There's lots of stuff to pray for. Pray for our government. There are plenty of things to pray for. Watch a news show and then go and go and pray. <laughs> the news, just watching the news will give you lots of stuff to pray for, believe me. We need to have a prayer life. And we need to have a scripture life. You need to read, read the Bible every day. Ask God for discernment to show you things in there. And I would say if you're not doing that, then you should start. Amen. You need to start. Lord, it's been good to be here in your presence today. It's been good to praise you, to worship you. It's been good to share the word. And you are so good to us, Lord. You are just so good. And we praise and thank you for that. We pray that you'll be with all of us until next time we meet. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen.